all stand in this house and begin to praise God. Come on. We got 30 seconds before the service starts. And I truly believe that we can start on the right foot, which is in the direction of praising and giving thanksgiving to the God who loves us, to the God that we worship and we praise. Hallelujah. Power like the power of Jesus. 
Nobody has his power. Nobody's like our God. We worship you, oh God. Amen. God is good this morning, and we give him praise for all that he's done. We also give him praise for what he's about to do. Amen. Amen. It's good to see Sister Brown back with us. Had a little procedure done, and she's doing well. And God answered a prayer that we prayed, and everything checked out good. And we give God praise again for that. But we do want to go to the Lord in prayer. Remember Richard Black going for surgery this uh, Thursday for his rotator cuff. Remember Tony Rawson didn't steal a lot of joint pain with those cancer treatments, and is affecting his joints. Remember Paul Parrish, he's facing cancer. Terry Jones, she's got an illness this morning. We want to pray that God would touch that. Roy White is losing blood, having surgery this morning. Also remember the family of Brother Dwayne Thrasher. He was the pastor at Columbia, and he passed away. Remember that family and also that church family that's reeling um, with this loss of a pastor this morning. Let every unspoken request, let it just be known by the uplifting of your hand. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. God, we ask that you would begin to move upon these needs and requests, every spoken and every unspoken request, Lord, today. We pray that you would be upon Richard's shoulder this uh, week, God, as he faces surgery. Let healing be upon him. We pray for Tony today, God, that you would touch these joint pains. Uh, God, give him healing over this body. We pray for Paul Parrish and the cancer that's attacking his body. Let healing be upon him. We pray, God, for Terry today that you would begin to move upon this illness and this situation in her mind. We pray for Roy White, Lord, as he's facing surgery today, that, God, you would guide the surgery. Uh, Lord, move and minister. Be with this uh, pastor's family. They lost uh, him today. We pray, God, that you would be with this church family, be with this wife and this children, Lord. Uh, God, guide them and protect them. Give them peace of mind. And we'll be sure to give you praise and glory. Anybody got a special need this morning that you would like prayer for, we'd ask that you would come on up this morning. The ministry would gather together and pray for you. Amen. We want to give God opportunity to work and opportunity to move. Because I believe he can and I believe he will. Amen. As they come, ministry, would you come? And let's, let's pray for these special needs today. Hallelujah, Jesus.
Come on, can we believe with our brothers and sisters today? I feel faith rising in the room. Can I give a praise report real quick? We were at the service last night where Brother Hunter began to minister. Myself, Brother Marcus, and Brother Jonathan felt compelled to pray with this young man. I reached over to the lady beside. I said, I need you to tell me his name. She said, his name is Caleb. I said, do you know what the need may be? She said, well, first and foremost, he needs to be refilled with the Holy Ghost. And he also has been having some seizures. So I told Brother Marcus, we gathered around and we began to pray for Caleb. It wasn't but just five seconds and the Holy Ghost came back into that man. And I truly believe that may, the next time he goes to the doctor, they're going to say, I don't, I don't know why. I don't know how. But there's no more seizures. I feel it rising in this church right now. Does anyone feel what I feel? The God of all miracles is settling down. The God of all healing is settling down. Come on, let's begin to praise. God, we worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, we love you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, God. Oh, we love you, Jesus. Hey. I was buried beneath my shame. And who could carry that kind of weight? Oh, it was my tomb till I met you. Oh, help me say, I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. All my failures I tried. Too high. It was my tomb. It was my tomb. Till I, till I met you. You call my name. You call my name. Sing it out. And I ran out of that grave. Oh, out of the dark. Out of the dark. Into your, into your glorious day. Freedom is all I've ever known. Now your freedom Hallelujah. is all yes, Jesus. that I know. The old man knew. The old man knew. Jesus, when I met you. Jesus, when I met you. The old man knew. The old man knew. Jesus, when I Jesus, when I Say met one more you. Say time. The old, the old man knew. When I met my Savior. Jesus, when I
You're in the light of Christ. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Come on, 10 more seconds. Come on, 10 more seconds. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of that praise? Yes, he is. No one greater. No one stronger than him. situation do you need him to move in your family i know a god that is in this place right now come on you fashion me you form my heart you search my soul and know every thought love so great but never to part you're there through the storm through the storm
just for a second without a shadow of a doubt believe that God is working in your situation before we take another step further before we move on to the next dimension let's just begin to thank God oh God you're working I trust in you you're the same yesterday today and forever and I believe that you move back then I believe that you're moving today I believe you're gonna move for me in the future Lord we trust in you God. we love you Lord hallelujah let's give a hand clap of praise to the Lord church Amen. I believe that God is here and God is present and He's able to do exceeding abundantly. If you stand in need of something today, I wouldn't leave here unless God answered it for me. Because He is here and He's present and able to move and minister in a special way. In a special way. Give honor to all you fine folks for being here today. We have several out. There's decoration going on and half our ministry team's out preaching, ministering other places. But we're glad you're here. Look to you and say, I'm glad you're here this morning. There's a good number here today, and we give honor to all of you, to all of our guests. It's good to have uh, Brother Mr. Helms with, back with us today, and it's good to see Rebecca and Mitchell with us today, and to everybody else, we just lay claim on you. Let's give our guests a hand. And it's good to see Grandmother here with us. She's been back just several times now, and she's just part of us. The Michael's mom, we're good to have her as well. And we're going to be dismissed uh, for our classes today is uh, Children's Church. You're going to have a good time in Children's Church out in the upper room. Is also Sister Judy be teaching our teen boys and our teen girls. If you're a teenager, 19 years down to 13 years, you're welcome to go out into the student center. And nursery class is still going on. And thank you to all of our Young Marriage class. Yes, Young Marriage class, you got to remind me. There's so much stuff going on. Young Marriage class is be the meeting in the fellowship hall. If you or your spouse is 30 years old or younger, you're welcome to go to the fellowship hall. And you'll be blessed, blessed there. Amen. And everybody that's left is going to be stuck in here to hear Pastor teach this morning. Revelations chapter 12. Don't get too scared. Let's go into the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through verse 9. With every message is different how God gives it to us, um, as many of you ministers can attest to. And I used to sleep all night long until I became pastor. And I don't know that I've slept a solid from the time I laid my head on the pillow to the next time morning when it was time to get up since I've become pastor. And Thursday night, I believe it was sometime, I don't know what time in, in the morning it was, but oftentimes I'll awake and it's like God's speaking to me in that moment, whether it's laying somebody upon my heart, whether uh, it's just something that he's dealing with me about, whatever. And it's just like, as soon as I wake up, Brother Summer, it's like, there it is. And and I'm, and I'm still tired and half out of it. And I know if I don't grab my phone and write it down at that moment, I'm going to forget it. And this is the way it was Thursday night. Two things just immediately came to mind. It said, Satan the deceiver and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so I just wrote that down. I know what that means. We'll figure it out when I got fully awake, hopefully. And uh, I've been wrestling with that and was going a different direction this morning, but I keep going back to that word he spoke to me, and I hope that I can deliver what he's laid upon my heart today. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil and Satan, and then pay attention to this next sentence here, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. He deceiveth the whole world. I want to talk just for the next little while about the devil's deception. The devil's deception. Deception. Has, has anybody ever been deceived by anything? besides me 
Maybe it was when you went to the grocery store and you bought that big bag of chips, but you opened it up <laughs> and found out it's about that much in the bottom. Anybody ever been frustrated with a bag of chips besides me? Uh, I like those that's got the clear window in the front. That way you can see through the bag and know, know what it is that's in there. Um, maybe some of you ladies have ordered something offline and in the picture it looked this big, but when you got it in, it was this big. <laughs> Has that ever happened to me? I seen one uh, the other day where somebody had ordered uh, a cat scratching post and had a little thing hanging from it, supposedly for a cat to, to play with, and they got it in it. It was that tall. It was a toy one. <laughs> they were deceived. It didn't, it didn't tell it too much in the description. They didn't tell much about it. So the pictures were deceiving. Maybe, maybe it was the truck you bought, that nice Ford truck that everybody bragged about. You got it home only to find out it's using oil. You were deceived. Maybe, maybe it's a friend on Facebook that messaged you out of the balloon and says, how are you doing? And you respond, I'm fine, how are you? Well, I'm good now that what happened to me yesterday, would you like to hear more about it? <laughs> it, it, it's, it, it, they've been, uh, you're trying to be scammed here. If you, ain't, if you haven't had that conversation with somebody, somebody has uh, hacked them and they're trying to get you and trying to deceive you into giving them money. I, I can remember, matter of fact, the, the missionary and them had, it came Wednesday night and we went to carry them to McDonald's only because McDonald's the only place open in Decatur County. Uh, after nine o'clock on Wednesday night, but we enjoyed our time there with them, and, and they began to ask me and my wife said, "Well, how did y'all meet? Where did you meet?" And I said, "Well, let me just tell you the story." It was at youth camp, and I come up, and I was 17 years old, and I asked her, and it was a long time ago. I said, "How old are you?" She said, "I'm 15." I said, 15, 72 years. That ain't bad. When's your birthday? Next month. Oh, so you're going to be 16? No, I'm going to be 15. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm not saying she lied. I'm just saying <laughs> she deceived me. <laughs> but I'm glad she deceived me. She said, that's the way women work. Whenever you're that close, you just go ahead and say, oh, okay. But I have learned that some people are very good at deception. Anybody been around somebody that's very good at deception? We may know that that person's very evil to their core, and you watch them put on a front and put on a face in front of people, and you're, you're wanting to tell that person that they're talking to, run for your life. <laughs> they're deceiving you. That's not who they are. But let me just... Do a little side note and just tell us here today, you do not have to expose somebody like that because they will eventually expose themselves. Sometimes we want to take things in our own hands and expose them and tell, them, tell people who they really are, but it would be better as Christians, as children of God, just to keep our lip zipped and let God work it out. I don't care how bad they treated you and how messed over they did you. Just let it, it's going to come out. But there are masters of deception in this world. They're so slick with their words and manipulation that they seduce those that are around them into thinking that they're better than who they really are. But nobody, no person is as good at deception as the devil. In the scriptures that I read to you in verse 9, the Bible says that, that the great dragon was cast out. John said, let us expose him with all of his names. The great dragon, the old serpent, the devil, Satan. All these are just one individual here. And it says, he that has deceiveth the whole world. Now, I don't know about anybody here. You may deceive one or two people, but you're not deceiving everybody. Somebody's going to look through your words. They're going to look through your actions and know who you really are. But the Bible lets us know that the devil deceives the whole world. 
In other words, you're not above being deceived by the devil. Now, you ministers in here, Brother Sumner, Brother Blackwell, I, I know you're great, powerful men of God, but you're not above the devil's deception. There's not anybody, I don't care how much you pray, how much you fast, the devil is so good at deception, if we're not careful, he will come and slip the wool over our eyes before we ever realize it. He's out to get every one of us. He is, he, he's got a personal agenda with you. If you don't know that, you've got to be on guard. We've got to uh, be watched for his, for his deceptions. First Peter 5 and 8 tells us, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary. Somebody say your adversary. It's not the adversary. It's your adversary. It's not a devil that's attacking your neighbors or attacking the one sitting beside you. It's your adversary, the one that's coming against you, that's trying to deceive you. He's as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. He's telling us, you keep sober. Don't get drunk with the cares of this life. Don't get so caught up on somebody's words or somebody's actions but that you're constantly looking for the devil to come and to attack you. Be vigilant. Stay awake. Be watchful because he's your adversary. And he's walking around looking for somebody to swallow up. It's his desire to steal, to kill, and to destroy you. I, I know that it's very obvious by me saying this, but let me just tell you this today. The devil is not your friend. The devil is not your family's friend. The devil is not your children's friend. His actions, his speech, he crafts them in such a way that he will try to deceive you into thinking that it's okay and that it's all right to go this path or to do this thing, but be wary of his deception. The Bible tells us that he is the liar and he is the father of it, and there is no truth in him. But the problem is that sometimes we can't tell he's lying. Some of you have got kids that are very good at this. I've got a couple of them myself that it's hard to tell when they are telling the truth. That they can tell it in such a way that you know that what they're saying is probably not right, but you don't have no way of proving it. And they make it so uh, enticing that you believe them. Can, can I get any parents that would agree with me today? I don't want to call my kids liars, but... Sometimes they, they, they walk right along that edge of telling the truth or not telling the truth. And, and so it is with the devil that sometimes he, he's the father of lies. He's nothing but a lie. But he cloaks it. He covers it up. And he, and, he, and, he, and he presents it in such a way that it doesn't really feel like it's a non-truth. It doesn't feel like it is a lie. And that's when he becomes the deceiver. The deceiver that deceiveth the whole world. He'll make you think that the lie that he whispers in your ear is nothing but the truth. And he clothes that lie with garments that look so much like truth that you'll think it is truth. Paul would even say that Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. That it looks right and it feels right. Even sounds sweet to the ear, but the reality of it is he's just a wolf in sheep's clothing. He has, he has covered himself up and, 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 and presented himself to you that it seems so innocent and seems so insignificant and it seems so, so right, but yet it deceives even the very elect. It, it deceives us that, that are watchful. It deceives us that are prayerful. It deceives us that are watching for the devil's tactics, but yet we've got to expose him and how he deceives us this morning. Luke 21 and 8 says, Take heed that you be not deceived. He's speaking of false prophets here. There are people that's going to come in and try to seduce you and try to, to whisper in your ear and get you to turn from truth. But you don't be deceived. Take heed. Be aware of it. Look for it. Because if we're looking for the deception, we will be more aware 
of the deception. 2 Corinthians 2 and 11 says, Lest Satan should get advantage of us, for we are not ignorant. I like to think we're not ignorant, but sometimes we act kind of ignorant. I mean, let me just put my... Brent sometimes acts ignorant when it comes to dealing with the devil. I look back over my life at some of the times I've fallen flat on my face, and I'm thinking, did you not see that coming? You knew what the devil was doing, but yet we still get caught up in that. We cannot. We, we're not ignorant of his advice. Now, 2 Corinthians, it's very easy to take this out of context here because it's talking about forgiveness and forgiving others. And, and, he, and he said, you better forgive people. You better forgive your neighbor. You better forgive the one that sinned. You better forgive the one that messed up because that's how the devil will trip you up. And we're not ignorant of that. We know he, he causes us to hold grudges, and we know this. But that's not the only way he deceives us. And we've got to be on guard. And God gives us revelation of who the devil is. And so we cannot claim ignorance. We know how he works. The Bible says that God one time winked at man's ignorance, overlooked it. And that's before they had knowledge of, of right and wrong. But now that you've got knowledge of who he is, he commands every, I men everywhere to repent. So why then does deception work so well? Why is it that we as Christians, we as apostolic, Holy Ghost filled people fall prey to the same thing, seem like over and over, and when we know it, why does it work so well? Begin to do some research on deception. There was an ancient Chinese general by the name of Sun Tzu who is credited with writing the book that you may have heard of that's been around for hundreds of years called The Art of War. Many generals that that command their armies go back and look at this book called The Art of War. And in this book, he says, all warfare is based on deception. It's not what you actually do to the enemy. It's what that enemy thinks that you're about to do to them. That's all about war. If, as, as long as they think this way, that's really all that matters. You don't have to do it. You just got to have them to think that you're doing it that way. Hence, when we are able to attack, we must seem that we're unable to attack. When we use our forces, we must appear that we're inactive and we're not using our forces. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe that we are far away. And when we are far away, we must make the enemy believe that we are near. Pretty good stuff. And that's how the devil works. He can be right next to you, but you feel like he's so far away. Or you can feel that he's so far away or, or, and he's right there or he, you think he's right here and he's really far away. He just, he's just constantly deceiving his people. And we can be tricked into thinking one way, you'll never see the truth until it's too late. That's how deception works. It works so well. When I think of deception, I think of one man throughout the Bible, and that's a man by the name of Jacob who went on to be Israel, began to be a nation. But all throughout the life of Jacob, he, he starts out, he disguises himself as his brother, who is nothing like him. He is smooth, and his brother's hairy, and he, his brother's a hunter, and he's a man of the field. And, and all these stuff are different, but he disguises himself. He deceives his father that can't see very good. He comes before him, and, and he steals that brother's birthright. Then he goes to work for his fiance Rachel, with his father, his father-in-law then deceives him. He works seven long years, and when it's time to get Rachel, lo and behold, he pulls the veil back, and, and there is Leah. He's deceived yet again. Then he gets his father-in-law back by uh, taking the cattle and says, you know what, I'll take the old speckled and spotted and striped cattle, and, and, and you take all of the solid cattle, and we'll call it a deal. All right, let's shake hands on it. But then he deceives his father-in-law by breeding these cattle and making them to be a lot, have a lot of spotted, a lot of ring straight, a lot of striped cattle. It's all about deception, deception. Later in life, Jacob was deceived even by his own sons that brought the bloody, colorful coat to their father, Jacob, and Israel, and said, here, your, your son that you love, Joseph, was murdered. And he was deceived, thinking that his son was murdered. His whole life was filled with deception that the cat and mouse game played throughout his life. And while this recorded in Scripture about Jacob, I wonder what your life would look like if it was penned down in Scripture. I wonder what my life would look like 
deception after deception after deception. That one time that you knew you were supposed to stay away from that person, but yet you caught yourself up next to them, and the devil wrapped his arms around you and pulled you away. You knew it, but yet you were deceived. Deception. Deception works so well. The devil uses his trickery to cause us to mess up, and we see it, and yet we still do it. How many of you would be honest enough to admit to me today that the time, some of the times that you have fallen, that you have messed up, you saw it coming a mile away, but yet you did nothing about it? Because we can know it. We can see it, but yet still fall flat of our face time and time and time again. Deception works so well. I don't think that I would be a good deceiver. My face tells off on me. Um, wouldn't be a good poker player. I couldn't sit across the table from you and play poker with you because you would know exactly what I had. Because if I pulled up a good hand, I couldn't help but smile about it. Thinking, I'm going to get them now. And if I pulled up a bad hand, you could probably see the look of de dejection upon my face. Because poker is really all about deception. They say you don't let them know that you got a good hand because if you want to take their money, you want them to think you got a bad hand. And you especially don't want them to know that you got a bad hand if you got money out on the table because they're going to take your money. You got to bluff them. The one with the best hand says, go ahead, buy, and I ain't got hardly anything. Man, I, I almost folded last time. Nothing bad is going to happen to you. Just shove it all out there on the table. And then they can flip it over and take all your money. And so it is the devil deceives Eve in the garden. Didn't God say that you could eat of every tree in this garden? Well, yeah, he said every tree but this one. He said this one tree right here that we cannot touch it or eat of it. Because if we do, we'll die. And the devil whispers in his ear, you, you shall not surely die. God just knows that when you eat it, that your eyes are going to be open. It's not a real death. Come on. You, you'll be like God's, knowing good and evil. And so Eve touches the tree, what she wasn't supposed to do. We all talk about her eating, but the Bible says that she said, we can't even touch it. The problem happened when she touched it. How many times does God just say, stay away from that? Well, I'm not eating it. I'm just touching it. It's like Sunday. We can tell Sunday. He said, boy, don't you touch that. He'll look at you just dead eye and get just as close to it as he can get. <laughs> Be not deceived, boy. I'm going to whoop that. Backside of for you. And sometimes... Let me just get where we're living at. Sometimes pastor sets things in place and puts a, a, a line and says, you know what, you really don't need to cross this line because if you get here, you may touch it because we know if you touch it, then you're going to partake of it. And Satan says, oh, come on, Eve, just touch it. Just touch it. It's not going to hurt anything, but if you touch it, you're going to eat of it. And so she touches it, and then she eats of it. And then God kicks them out of the garden. It was the fall of mankind. And sin now is a part of our everyday struggle, not necessarily because she touched it or because she ate of it, but because the devil deceived her into doing something she knew she wasn't supposed to do. Because we can have all the head knowledge of what we're supposed to do. We can read the Word of God and know this is what it says about this certain subject in this certain way. And we can know it but still do it because of the deception of the devil. He's so good at weaving the story. Nothing bad will happen to you. A little sin never hurt anybody. Stop listening to the devil. Stop listening to him. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 10. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? And if you don't know, let me just carry it a step further. Be not deceived. Don't you begin to think that any of these people can enter into heaven. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, 
nor adulterers, nor effeminate. Can I get a witness from some of you men in the house? Nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. That's as plain as you can get it right there. He's saying, don't be deceived. Let me give you a list of people that ain't going to make it to heaven. And if you ever think that any of these people is going to walk through the pearly gates, don't be deceived by it. We live in an age that it seems like just everything can go and you can just march right up on the streets of gold. You can live how you want to live. You can partake in what you want to partake in. You can get involved in whatever sin you want to be involved in because God's a merciful God. God's a gracious God. And I thank God that he's full of mercy and he's full of grace because I found it to be true. I found it to be right. I found it to be real. But don't you be deceived that this God of mercy won't one day step on a throne of judgment and begin to point his finger and say, you depart from me because I know you not. There's going to be a line, Drew, one day, and we got to make sure we're on the right side of the line. It bothers me to see churches letting down on things that they've stood for for years. It bothers me to see families let down on things that has been handed down to them and trusted in their care. Now they're saying it's okay to do that. It's okay to go there. and It's okay to do it. We cannot, we must not be deceived by that. We cannot fall for his trick. We know it's wrong to eat of it, but surely we can touch it. We know that that's what mom and daddy preached and lived for. We know that's how we were raised, but let me just go and touch it. I don't know why I keep going back to this whole touching deal. It, it, I'm trying to be nice this morning. I really am, especially because we got guests here on Sunday morning. And I can't be too hard or too, but we know that we are not supposed to eat and partake of these things. But we want to get as close to it as we possibly can without sticking it in our mouth so we can just touch it, but we're not eating of it, Pastor. God, help us to know and realize the very dangers of deception. Is if, if the dangers of what the devil tries to do, if he can get you close enough to touch it, he'll get you eating of it. I've watched people that get involved in things. They do it little by little by little. They partake of it just a little bit. And I, I'm just going to do this. I'm keeping these boundaries in place. I'm, I'm not going to eat of it. I'm just going to touch it. But we've got to be careful that we don't touch it because if we touch it, we will partake of it. Why do we separate ourselves further than, from the boundaries than what everybody else do? Because we know that principle of the touch is the deception of the devil. If he can get you close enough, he will wrap his arms around you like a spider in a web. If you get close enough to that web, you're caught, and that's all he needs to get his web wrapped around you. You know people. People are coming to your mind even right now that, that, that you think of that they, they didn't start off that way. It was just a touch, and then before you know it, then their hand got stuck, and then they stuck this hand, it got stuck, and before you know it, they were wrapped up in sin and messed up and God, help us, help us, help us, help us. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 13, the Bible says, But evil men and seducers, those that seduce us, that make you think everything's okay, shall wax worse and worse. They are deceiving and being deceived. They're not deceiving you on purpose. They're deceived themselves. They've been tricked by the enemy of thinking this way is right and this way is holy. And there's false prophets are arising in this land that we live in and false preachers and false teachers are not teaching the word of God. They want to go by man's agenda and what feels good and what looks good and what feels right. They've been deceived and now they're deceiving others. But verse 14 says, But continue thou in the things that thou hast learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom hast thou hast learned them. Don't fall for their tricks. You hold on to what you know. You hold on to what you've been taught. You hold on to what, uh, because of who has taught them to you. If God's ever spoke to you and told you to stay away from this certain thing, don't get wrapped up in that thing. If God ever spoke it to you before, you might as well stay away from it. Because God told you. Because God convicted you. 
I don't care if they bring out this scripture or they bring out that and they twist the word of God to try to make you think that it's okay to partake in it. If God said leave it alone, leave it alone. Don't be so quick to abandon principles that you were once so sure of. Don't fall for that deception of the devil. Let us look into the tactics of the devil this morning. I'm going to be looking in a scripture where the devil tempts Jesus at and taking some thoughts from that. But before we get there and before you form it in your mind, let me just say, well, yeah, that was Jesus. That's not Brent. It's different when it's me being the one attacked by the devil. Let's look in scripture in Hebrews 4 and 14 saying, says, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is, that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our profession for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities said all that to say this one last little line here but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need he was tempted just like you this fleshly body of Jesus was tempted just like you're tempted and he made it he didn't fall from the deception of the devil and if he did it you can do it if he did it you can do it there will be times when he trips you up and you fall for his deceptions and you you, you feel this tall and you feel like you can't find it that's why God said because he did it because he made it through temptation we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Understand that if you fail this morning, if you fall and flat of your face, if you've got sin in your life, let me just stop for a moment and tell you there's grace to be found for you. You can walk into the throne of grace and you can obtain mercy and find grace in your time of need. But I want to take this story found in Luke chapter 4. We'll be reading Luke 4 through 1 through 13 of how the devil came and tried to tempt Jesus. And, and I want to take some principles and, and, and try to bring it before our eyes so that we know how the devil works and how the devil is trying to deceive us. Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, there again he is full of the Holy Ghost and still tempted by the devil. Don't you think for a moment that because you got the Holy Ghost that it's going to be a life of roses never a temptation from the devil never had to fight with desires you never had to fight with the pull of the flesh when you're full of the holy ghost the devil will still come and tempt you he returned from jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness god took him to the wilderness being 40 days tempted of the devil and in those days he did eat nothing and when they were ended he afterward hungered. Imagine that. Forty days without food, and he was hungry. I love scripture. The devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. Now God, we know, know he was full of the Holy Ghost, and he was led by the Spirit, and immediately he was tempted of the devil. And the devil, the first thing that the devil tells him, says, if you'll take these stones, we know, God, that you have power to take these stones and turn them on the bread and eat it. It wasn't just about the power of God. It wasn't just about the devil trying to get him to display his power. I believe it was simply because he was hungry and he could make bread appear and he could satisfy his flesh. You see, the devil will come at you when you're the weakest, number one. He was 40 days without food, and he was hungry, and he wanted food probably more than he wanted anything else at that moment. His desire was to eat food, and the devil come at him, tempted him, and said, well, here's some food. Why don't you fulfill your fleshly desires? Let me know that the Spirit can be upon you, leading you places, and yet you can still be overcome by desires of the flesh. The deception of the devil is to tell you to just give in to your desires. 
Give in to those fleshly wants. Give in to those things that your flesh desires. You'll never be so spiritual that you won't have temptations. The devil will tell you that you aren't spiritual because you've got those temptations. He'll tell you, he'll whisper in your ear just because you're tempted and just because those thoughts are flooding your mind and that desire of the flesh is there that you aren't spiritual. But we read in the Word of God where God was led by the Spirit, He was full of the Holy Ghost, and yet still had a desire. He was still hungry. He still had fleshly desires. What makes you spiritual is not what crosses your mind. What makes you spiritual is what you do with what crosses your mind. The devil's deception is to get you to give in to those things that cross your mind. He'll, his deception is to say, well, it crossed your mind. You might as well do it anyways. Give in to the flesh. Fulfill the desires of the flesh. He attacks Jesus with what he wanted the most at that moment. But it only records the conversation with the devil after 40 days. But the Bible says that for 40 days... For the entire 40 days that the devil was tempting him. Now it's easy to say no to the devil when it's a one-time deal. But what happens when it's consistent day after day after day after day? Can you still say no to your flesh? What happens when we get to where we're living, you men are... Walking into the factory and that same girl, day after day after day. Can you still say no? It's that constant barrage that uh, over time he will wear you thin and wear you out to where you finally get to the point where you say, you know what, why don't I just give in to my flesh? That is how the devil works. That's how he deceives us. You see, we, we see people that mess up. We see people that fall, and, and we look at that, but we don't see the, the day after day after day that they have withstood that and got away from it and, and, and shrugged it off. Let me just tell you, if the devil keeps attacking you with the same thing over and over again, you might ought to make some changes in your world to keep that from popping up again and again and again. It may need to be a relationship that you need to delete, social media that you need to delete, a phone number you need to delete places that you go that you stop going if the devil keeps tempting you with the same thing over and over and over again do something to prevent it from happening how do you resist that fleshly desires and constant temptation because we live in a world that says if it feels good do it we cannot let our own fleshly desires overtake our judgment and have dominion over our desires cannot have dominion over us Romans chapter 6 verse 12 says let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof your desires don't don't you let it reign because if you let it it's going to grow and it's going to overtake you and, and it's going to be in charge of you and it's going to have dominion over you and it's going to rule over your life neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God for sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under the law but under grace I don't know but I'm not going to fall prey to the adversary and let him have dominion over me I may mess up one day but you know what's going to happen the next day I'm going to shrug it off and I'm going to fall and reach back after God again you need to tell that devil that you may have got me. You may have tripped me up today, but tomorrow if I fall, I shall arise. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to take dominion over my flesh. Let me just, just I, I've seen that illustration. You've heard it, but let me just r relate to it again this morning. Those of you who don't have it, the flesh is like two dogs, one on each shoulder. It's the good dog, the evil dog, and the little boy, after hearing this, he said, well, how do you know which dog's going to win in the fight? And the answer came back to him, the one that you feed the most. 
Sometimes we struggle with flesh because we feed it the most. Temptations come and flash in front of us because all we do is feeding our mind with the lust of this world. If all you do is sit on your phone and go through social media or watch movie after movie, it's no wonder you deal with some of that stuff because you're feeding the flesh. But if you begin to feed the Spirit, it, it, it becomes amazing how much easier it is to overcome sin because you're prayed up and you're fasted up and you're digging yourself into the Word of God because you're feeding the Spirit and not the flesh. Help us, God. Help us, God, not to fall prey to the lust of the flesh and to the desires of the flesh. It could be anything. I know sometimes our mind automatically runs to the sexual nature of flesh. But flesh could be any desire that is not in line with the Word of God. It could be things that you just consume your own time with. It could be hobbies. Brother Sumner, it could be fishing. <laughs> oh, help us, Holy Ghost. Brother Billy, it could be work. It could be school. It could be whatever it is. If something that we worship and spend more time with before, put it before God, put it before our prayer time, put it before reading the Word of God, put it before church, that can be our fleshly desires because it's what our flesh desires. We want a bigger home. We want a nicer car. We want, we, because, so we do this and we fulfill the desires. Of, I'm not saying any of that is wrong. I'm saying it can be wrong. So we have to guard that and be on be, we got to be aware of the dis devil's deception because he'll take something so innocent. He'll take something that, that is not harmful for us, but he'll cause us to fall flat of our face because of it. Help us, Holy Ghost. And Jesus' response to him was in verse 4. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but of every word of God. What he was saying is, I'm not living by bread. I'm not living by my own desires. I'm basing my living on the Word of God. The more you read the Word of God, the more you'll fall in love with the Word of God. And what's amazing is if, if it, it never fails. What you read in the morning will be what you experience through the day. You'll, you'll look back, something happened to me in the middle of the day. And you, I just read that verse this morning. Matter of fact, I'm following this Bible program, Bible plan, reading plan. And I worked on this message the last three days. This morning, I pulled up my Bible program. The very first chapter that I read was Luke chapter 4. The very thing that I'm preaching this morning. God works that way. If we'll dive into the Word of God, it will be as a lamp unto my feet. It will show me every step that I'm supposed to go. It will illuminate the direction that we're supposed to take. It will guard us from the deception of the adversary if we dive into the Word of God. Let me encourage, encourage every one of you, uh, develop a life of reading the Word of God. Right. If it isn't nothing more than just a few verses of Scripture, the more, find yourself a time of day that you sit down and you open the Word of God, whether it's on your iPad, iPhone, or a little, literal Bible. I want you to fall in love with the Word of God. It will, it will be a light unto you. Right. It will be a light unto you. So he, he told us, I'm, he said, we're, we're, we're basing our life on the word of God. I've got dominion over my desires. The devil's distraction is to make you think that fulfilling the lust of the flesh is okay, but it just leads to death. It just leads to death. Then verse 5, the next thing that the devil tempts him with, and the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, in just a split moment, he showed the entire world. The devil said unto him, all this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. Therefore, if therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. This scripture is one of the most laughable scriptures in the word of God. The devil talking to Jesus and said, I'll give you all this stuff if you'll just bow down and worship me. The devil, another deception of the devil is deceiving you into thinking that he has power. He even come to God who has all power and looked at him and said, I'll give you all this stuff 
and I'll give you the power that goes with it if you'll just bow down and worship me. Another deception of that devil is he'll trick you into thinking that he's got power and dominion over you. But newsflash, he does not have power at all. You see, the devil wants you to feel helpless when he comes at you. It doesn't really matter. This is the whole deception of the devil. It doesn't matter that you are helpless over him. It's as long as you feel helpless. He wants you to feel powerless. Not that you are powerless, but that you feel powerless because that's the deception. If, as long as you believe it, that's all that really matters to him. He has no power. He cannot even read your mind. There's only one omnipresent uh, being in this world, and that's God who knows all time and space and feels everything. If he knew, if he could read your mind, he would have never attacked Job because he would have known that Job would have never bowed down and cursed God and bowed down to Satan. You, you don't even have to fight the devil. You just have to, the Bible says, resist him. Resist him. You don't have to pull up your dukes and fight and swing it out and, and go through spiritual warfare. All we have to do is the church, is, is, is if we're submitted to God, first and foremost, we've got to be submitted to God. But once we're submitted to God, all we have to do is resist the devil. And he'll flee from us. We, we think we've got this, I'm sorry us preachers have did this and created this deal about spiritual warfare. And I believe in spiritual warfare. I know that there are spirits that are fighting against us. And I believe in spiritual warfare. I'm not saying that. But we've created it and painted it up to be some of this big, great, glorious thing. when we really have power and dominion over the devil. All we have to do if we're submitted to God is resist him. We don't have to fight him. We don't have to spend time. We don't have to even waste our time on him. We just resist him and say, get back. Come on. Quit. Get out, get out of my house and get out of my life. You don't belong here. That's all we've got to do. Because the devil does not work with power. He has none. He works with feelings, making you feel like he has power. Because he's the master of deception. Because we know that perception becomes reality. If what we perceive becomes reality, I can perceive that that chair is sitting right here. And if I'm not careful, I'll go sit down on that chair right here because I perceive it to be right here. It's our perception that causes it to become reality. But God said, all power is given unto me, not the devil. The devil ain't got no power. And he goes further and says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We just got to perceive the right things. And this morning I perceive that my God is bigger than the adversary. He's bigger than that whisper that's in my ear. And if you can just think that your God is bigger, then your procession will become reality. And so in verse 8, God answered unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. I don't care if you think that you've got power to give me that stuff, but you get behind me, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thy serve. God commanded the devil to worship him. Because I believe that when you worship God, God gets a little bit bigger in your perception. When you worship him, he gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so you will worship what is biggest in your life. You can worship your problem this morning and glorify what's wrong in your life. Or you can worship the problem solver, and he becomes bigger than your problem. I never will forget missionaries, uh, brother and sister Showalter, telling a testimony years ago, and it stuck with me. She said, we can do two things. We can go to God and say, God, look how big my problem is. Or we can go to our problem and say, problem, look how big my God is. All right. It all depends on your perception. And how I perceive God is he is all-powerful and all-knowing. I better hurry on. We're running out of time. Verse 9, And he brought him to Jerusalem, set him in a pinnacle in the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast down thyself from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hand they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against the stone. He was saying, said, If you'll just give up your mission, give it up. I know you're come. Uh, to bring salvation to the world, but just give it up. After all, you won't die. You've got plenty of time. 
the next greatest and last point I want to hit is the devil will whisper to you and deceive you into thinking that you've got all the time in the world. But the truth is, we're all living on borrowed time. Sister Mangan said it this way, our cradle rocks against the tombstone. We're here just for a vapor of time and then it quickly vanisheth away. We know, we know that judgment is soon coming. The Bible tells us it's appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Come on, you got plenty of time. You may realize the deception of the devil telling you and whispering you to you that you've got plenty of time when you stand before the judgment throne of God, but let me tell you that time's going to be too late. And I've come to let you know what the devil's deceiving you at this morning. If you are lost and undone without the Holy Ghost, let me tell you, you may not have very much time left. And when we stand in judgment that day, we will gladly exchange all that we have accomplished in this life for eternal life with him, but it's going to be too late. Everything that we've worked so hard to attain, we'll gladly throw it all away for a chance to spend eternity in heaven. Your credit score will not matter. Your stocks that you've invested in will not matter. The vehicle that you drive or the home that you live in, it will not matter. The amount of friends that you have and prestige that you have, it won't matter. Even the family that you hold so dear will not matter. The only thing that will matter that day is your soul. So let me ask you what matters today. How many of you have thought, well, I'll straighten up tomorrow. I'll get it fixed next week. Next month, I'll straighten it out. The Bible says, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Because when there is a second coming, of Jesus Christ, everybody, every single one of us in this room is going to be judged. I thank God for grace and mercy, but grace and mercy is going to be over with on that day. And only those that are full of the Holy Ghost and those that are following and living after God is going to make it to heaven. Be not deceived this morning. Sister Melissa, go ahead and come to the piano this morning. Let's, I tell you, let's just all stand all across this house. Hell is a real place this morning. It's not a joke. It's not something that we use as a scare tactic to try to scare people to an altar. It's reality. Hell is real. Hell, the Bible says, let me just describe hell through the scripture this morning. Hell is a place filled with fire and brimstone. It's a place where the worm dieth not and the fire is never quenched. It's a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a place where there will be torment day and night forever and ever and ever. It's a place, as Mark says, to avoid at any cost. Matter of fact, he says, if your hand offend thee, cut it off if your foot offend thee cut it off if thy eye offend thee pluck it out because it had better to go through life maimed halt and with one eye to miss hell than to go through life with two legs two eyes and two hands and split hell wide open because there is going to be a second coming and God sent me here today to tell you don't be deceived don't you listen to the lies of the adversary letting you know that you've got plenty of time left. Go ahead. Do what you want to do. You've got plenty of time left. Let me just read these last verses of Scripture. I know I'll go a little longer this morning, but let me just read Revelation chapter 20, verses 11. It paints a picture of what the second coming will be like. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose faith the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. 
I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And verse 15 is a very sombering scripture. It says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Don't be deceived. Don't fall for the devil's deception. Get right today. Find yourself a place of repentance and pour yourself out before God and let God fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Could we all lift our hands and pray right now? God, I pray that you would open up every heart, every mind in this house today. Help us to realize that time will soon be no more. Help us to realize and stop listening to the adversary. Trick us into thinking that we've got plenty of time left. If you don't have the gift of the Holy Ghost, let me just invite you to this altar this morning and let you know that you can find hope today. You can make it right today. Come on, church family, let's, let's pray a little bit this morning. Let's lift up our voices and pray that God would quicken a heart, that God would stir a soul today. God, we pray right now that you would begin to move and do your work and do what you set out and intended to do in this morning service. We pray, God, for every heart that does not know you and the power of the Holy Ghost, that you would begin to draw and pull upon those heartstrings right now. That, God, if there's even, even a question in our hearts, if there's even doubt in our mind, that, that when the judgment day comes and when that trumpet sounds one day, God, if there's a hint that we may not make it, God, I pray that we would make sure that everything's right. Help us, God. Help us, God. Help us, God. God, I pray that you would make every person in this building aware of the devil's deception to realize and see and understand the tricks of the adversary today. Let your word, God, remain that was taught this morning. Find its way into our heart for the rest of this week. Help us to feast on it and chew on it and dwell on it. And God, we give you praise and glory and honor. Now, can we give God a hand clap of praise in this house today? Amen. You might be seated. If our ushers would make their way around, give you a chance to give to the kingdom of God. Brother Jonathan, you would help Brother Brown today.
come on this morning. Keen's kids come sing today.
Sunday, we are spotlighting another one of our missionaries, which is the India. Uh, we're going to be spotlighting a missionary pastor and sister Shil Morar. Uh, they are from India. Um, Brother Morar sends a newsletter, um, which is printed quarterly, then a personal letter addressed to the pastor in the church. In his newsletter, he provides pictures and a brief explanation. I'm going to share with you from both of these today. Pastor and Sister Morar just celebrated the 110th anniversary. I don't know if I'm saying this right. By Rosa Gar Mission. It was started by Sister Dorothy McCarty and Brother Morar's grandparents, Pastor and Sister uh, Samuel Morar on November 11th, 1911. So they've been doing this missions for 110 years. Brother Morar states celebrations were nothing less than exceptional. A Holy Ghost visitation was experienced in every service. All the saints were challenged, encouraged, and renewed by the anointed messages. Picture number two. Those who had drifted away got back to God in repentance and submission. It was humbling to see many heathens who have been attending our services for quite some time, responding to the word of God and filling the altar, searching for God, needing him to move and transform their lives, and he did. And picture three, he states, we are waiting for the right time to baptize them as their family may cause trouble if we do it openly. How blessed that we are that we have the freedom to get baptized and do not have to worry about any distractions. In picture five, the Lord provided enough money to buy two motorcycles for our pastor, Rom and Denise. Both have evangelized their areas on bicycles for about 25 years. The place where Pastor Denise holds meetings, the landlord has decided to use it for his own family. We are losing a large place to gather, and Pastor is losing a place to live. Please help us pray that God will provide another suitable place. In his personal letter that he sends uh, addressed to us, Greetings in the name above every name in heaven and earth, Jesus. We have been thinking of you and praying specially for you. Thank you so much for your four letters and enclosed checks. We are deeply grateful to you for your many years of faithful remembrance of this work in India. You will receive a rich reward from our Heavenly Father given to all that win souls for him. The enemy is doing its best to prevent souls from being saved. The momentum of evangelism has been hindered greatly because of the anti-conversion policies of the state as well as the federal government. But even in these adverse circumstances, the Lord is giving us several new outreach opportunities. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. We have been blessed to see three new families come into our services. They come from long distance. I was so deeply touched when a young 13-year-old Hindu lad, Shiva, told me that whenever he kneels down to read the Bible and pray, tears start rolling down his face. His father has a great testimony of healing from the Lord. They are in need of the new birth experience. The schools have opened and life is getting back to normal after a partial lockdown due to COVID surge. We have been asking God to bind this pandemic. Many of our loved ones have fallen victim to it and several families have been devastated. Currently elections for our state legislative assembly are going on. We desperately need a change. Please pray with us for God's intervention. Faithfully yours in the service of the Lord. So keep remembering prayers. Um, our missions from India. All right, and thank you for giving to missions. If you ever decide to start opening up your pocketbook more on your weekly givings, and if you're wanting to give a different offering, put it toward missions, and I promise you, you'll be blessed. Don't put it to building fund, put it to missions. If you're going to have to pick between the two, put it toward missions. And I thank you for that. You give good in the missions. We had missionary here this past Wednesday night. Most of you seem to enjoy him and enjoy their ministry. They're going to Greece, and uh, we are excited that we are going to sponsor them at $100 a month, and that comes with your mission offering. Thank you for giving. <laughs> and also they had um, the little jar set up. We didn't take up a special offering. They just had the little jar set up. 
I know many of you bought things off their table, some glassware and different things from there. Um, but just in the jar alone, we raised $703 in our missions for their special project. And we thank you for that. Remember, ladies' prayer meeting tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. Ladies' prayer meeting tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. Next Sunday night, July the 17th, a baby share be held for baby Oliver and Dylan Amelia's uh, newborn. And we'll be held immediately after service at night. I believe you're to bring finger foods for that and enjoy a time of fellowship as we celebrate the birth of this baby boy. Youth camp is a week away, so no service a week from this Wednesday night. There will be no service here at DPC that Wednesday night. Be much in prayer for us to have a move of God and that God's protection to be upon us there as well. The last service, youth service of this month, July 27th, we're having back-to-school service. Bring your backpacks. Students, bring your backpacks. We want to pray over you, pray over them. Wear your school T-shirts. Show your school pride of where you went to school at or where you're going to school at. And then July the 30th, which is the last Saturday of the month, everybody who wants to go will be taking a trip to Etheridge, Tennessee, to visit, visit the Amish. We'll be leaving here at 8 o'clock. We'll be eating lunch at Rick's Barbecue, um, and we'll be touring the uh, Amish there on their buggies and there's they can fit up to 60 people so we need everybody wants to come you come and we'll have a good time amen brother Jerry Russian he's done gone he had a testimony I want to make sure he gives you a chance to test give a testimony for him because uh, God did something great for him this past week and we give honor for what God's doing among his people any other announcements need to be made tonight that and let's all stand let's pray this missile prayer and god will be with us the rest of the day lord jesus we thank you for everything you've done for us today and we're believing you're going to be with us give us traveling mercies